And you're up, Kathy. Okay, good evening. This um, is the Thursday meeting of the Joint Capital Planning Committee. Um, and we will be conducting this meeting virtually per governor's orders. So one of my first orders of business will to be to call on the committee members to make sure they can hear and be heard. And I want anyone who is public and viewing to know that we are recording this and all recordings are posted as well as minutes. Um, so I think I will go around the room, my room, um, in order of the pictures that I see and just if uh, unmute yourselves and indicate whether you can hear and we can hear you. Alex? Present. Tammy? Present. Carrie? Present. Oh. <laughs> Peter? Present. Mandy? I'm present. Sorry about the minutes, but is someone taking minutes? Yes, um, I am, Tammy, I am. Tammy volunteered okay. last week and she confirmed that she's still willing to do it, which is very nice. So I think we are missing one committee member, Andy Steinberg, who um, will likely be joining us later. So I think we are ready to start then, Sean, you might wanna put, uh, Andy just joined us. Andy, um, would, would you just indicate whether you can hear and then we can hear you? You can just say yes. Andy? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so tonight, um, as Sean show, has shown on the screen, we are going to be going through schools, conservation, planning, and recreation, although I'm uh, curious on whether we have a recreation. And I just wanna remind people that this is the last of the scheduled reviews of proposals. Next week, we will be turning to recommendation discussion of what we want to see in the report and Sean and I discussed he will send some um, things to think about once we're finished with tonight's meeting. Um, so um, and for those who are in the public there's this is information on how to um, dial in or connect with us and we will be taking public comments at the end of the meeting not before. Uh, so so Sean why don't you just introduce um, call on the speakers in the order that um, uh, you think that we're hearing from them. Yeah, so a couple um, little things. One, um, the packet had two pages tonight because there were a lot of projects in there. Um, so Kathy, one of your questions was about where some of the projects were. It's, it, it was, it's sort of, you don't see it when you first go there, but if you scroll to the top, there's a second page and okay. that's where some of those projects are. Um, the other piece is in addition to conservation and planning, um, we're going to be talking about the, um, the sustainability project that was under facilities, but we talked, we decided we would add it to tonight. And then I'm thinking we should go with recreation first because they just have one, Barb just has one project, um, okay. and the other two are, are more substantial. So, um, Barb, if you're okay going first, which I think you are, um, do you want to start? Sure, I'd be happy to start. So, um, so I'm assuming that you you all have the the project that we're um, referring to, the tennis court uh, refurbishment, correct? Yes. Everybody has that hand up. All right. So, just um, this shouldn't take very long. Um, basically, it's fairly straightforward. This is the tennis court at Mill River Recreation Area, and. Uh, the, the estimated cost for that project is $25,000. Um, let's see, so there are some key things that are going to happen there. Basically, it'll be re the cracks, uh, which there, there are beginning to be multiple cracks right now. Uh, they will need to be repaired. Uh, it will be sealed with a special um, sealant, which Snow provided me with some details on that. And uh, that sealant uh, is referred to as right, right way crack repair system. It's the system that they use and that, that allows for expansion. So hopefully in, 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 in the future, we won't see the type of cracks that we're seeing now that have broken away from, from the um, pavement. 
So um, that's, that's a little more expensive. So that's why it's a little bit of a higher price tag. But this also includes um, the, the painting uh, of the, and then of course, putting the lines on the, um, the tennis court as well. Also repairs to a replacement of nets and the structures that support the nets, um, the standards, if you will, um, that um, um, support those nets. So I think, you know, basically the idea here is to get this thing, get these courts up to the standard they should be at. Um, right now, you know, we're getting to a point if we don't take some action, they're, they're unsafe. So um, I would recommend um, um, definitely funding of this project. It's only $25,000. And uh, we'd just like to get on it, you know, as soon as possible. So any questions? No. Any questions around the room? I'm looking for hands raised. Mandy has oh, Mandy Mandy, Mandy, yeah, Mandy's, uh, Mandy's hand is up. I just said, yeah. yeah. OK. Um, it's not necessarily a question about the tennis facilities. Um, I know they're well used. Um, I, I would, and, and it's too late for CPA now. I would wonder whether you thought about applying for CPA funds for it. But um, they're on the future out years, um, Mill River and uh, the center of town, I don't know what one you, I guess that's War Memorial Playgrounds are listed as replacements. Um, and two questions on that one. With Mill River, um, it is really loved right now. Um, and so, you know, I, I know there's some improvements that could be done, but um, does it need replaced would be a question. But but the bigger question for both of them is, um, is that something that I know they're on this CIP plan, but Groff Park was paid mostly for from um, the CPA money, I believe. So is that something that's on the plan to plan for applying for, for those when they come around? Uh, CPA funds? Absolutely. I think, you know, we, this has been a placeholder for some time as far as JCPC. However, you know, Dave can speak to this as well. It is definitely on our radar to put that uh, uh, proposal through CPAC. Absolutely. Dave, did you want to add something to that? Sure, if it's okay with sure. Kathy. Um, yeah, no, Barb's spot on with that. I, I think our goal overall has been to really take a look at, you know, the su southern part of town. We did some great work uh, at Groff Park uh, with, with the spray park and the new playground. We're gonna get a new pavilion. We, we hope through CPA uh, down below. Um, we have the new park uh, CPA funded at Kendrick Park. And then we really need to take a look at the playground. Uh, I hear what you're saying, Mandy, that Mill River is very well loved, but it the structures there are, are very old and many of them do not meet ADA. In fact, the whole playground I don't think is ADA. So we actually, if, if that money hasn't uh, gone anywhere, Sean and Sonia, I believe we uh, a year or so ago did ask for some design money, Barb and uh, you were part of that with me. We asked for design money for uh, a, a new design for Mill River. So we'd like to spend um, some time on that in the coming year and then come back to CPAC and maybe a, a park grant at the state level to redo the play, play structures that are, that are north of the pavilion at Mill River. So, you know, if, if this proposal is funded for resurfacing the tennis courts, DPW is working hard on the new uh, basketball courts that will include both 10-foot baskets as well as eight foot, uh, a couple of eight-foot hoops. Um, the other piece of the Mill River uh, uh, playground, Mandy, was safety. We've had a number of children hit by baseballs coming off Mill 2, the Little League field there. So part of what we want to do is incorporate some new features to that, make it all ADA, and also address some of the safety issues of balls coming off that field. So that was, that was kind of the project. And again, I, I think in out years, we want to come back to uh, the plan uh, that we worked on for community field and the high school, which included a new playground at, um, you know, what is now, you know, War Memorial outside of War Memorial Pool. So. One other question. Have we ever considered skate parks? 
Uh, well, some of us who have been around a while, um, <laughs> you know, Barb and, and Chris and I for sure. I mean, Amherst had a lot of plans for skate parks. Um, I honestly, I never worked on that project. And I think there were many different, uh, many different attempts at that. And I, I honestly don't really know what happened to it. Um, I do know I've worked a little bit on skate parks like up in Turner's Falls when I worked there. And um, they were a little bit, I will say there was a little bit of a fad element to them in the, in the Northeast. And they kind of came and went in some communities. So communities spent a lot of money on them. And then they didn't, They, they I think freestyle, uh, I don't know if that's the right terminology, I'm dating myself, but more freestyle skating, uh, skateboarding became popular. So I don't know if the parks are as, as popular they were, as they were 10 years ago, but Barb, I don't know, were you involved? Yeah, in the yeah I was, you know, we, you know, for the last 20 years or so, you know, sort of come and go, there's been some enthusiasm, a little bit of traction, and then less enthusiasm. So sort of ebbed and flow. Float is, you know, there's like just what Dave said is, is it's just never really caught on. There hasn't been a huge movement of support so I think, um, and we've had so many other needs, if you will, improving um, what we have uh, has been a priority. And uh, so certainly that that has weighed into it as well. I do know the college campuses are providing skate parks free right now with all their paved surfaces. So I know they don't appreciate uh, all the skateboarding, but. I just want to make one comment on the tennis courts because I actually use them. They're up near me. And as Barb knows, one of the interesting things about our public courts is that plywood boards are underneath the nets to hold them up because the apparatus no longer works. Um, so if you think and think of, uh, uh, you have to, when you change sides, you have to avoid hitting the board that's sticking out from the net to hold it up. So I think this is well worth um, putting this as a top priority because we, do, we don't really have with Amherst College taking some of their courts out of in turning them into a parking lot actually but um, there aren't there aren't public courts in the same way they used to be um, so this is this is um, a good resource for us thank you thank you for bringing it forward thank you all right, I think the schools are next. So I don't know, um, Doug or Rupert, who's gonna lead that conversation? I think maybe I'm up, if you can hear me. Yes. Um, so uh, we have a number of uh, projects ongoing. Um, there's a lot there and a lot to digest. Um, I'd like to point out just sort of in general um, with Fort River and Wildwood, we're kind of in a holding pattern. We're trying to push down the road the things that we can, um, pending hopefully uh, some resolution to the new school building project. Um, but there are things that we need to do to just keep them uh, safe and viable. Um, so if I can just cherry pick a little bit from your long list, um, uh, there's been money set aside in the past for the Fort River roof repair. Um, what we need to do there is um, cover the valleys. We can, uh, we think we can buy uh, five to seven years uh, by um, covering over instead of stripping out uh, large sections of the valleys where most of the leaks come from uh, and redoing uh, some of the roof trains and um, some of the diverters uh, around the um, the courtyards. Um, we still have ongoing leak problems there. Uh, I expect they'll continue. Um, but hopefully this summer we can get a project going that will uh, buy us a bunch of time there. Um, uh, similarly at Wildwood, uh, that roof is slightly younger, but we're asking for some more money there to do uh, less substantial patching, but important patching all the same. Um, so those are a couple of big items to be aware of. In terms of the, uh, the parking lots, you'll see um, money for parking lots. This is really surface patching and filling. It's not a full scale parking lot redo, um, but it's what we need to do to keep them safe. 
otherwise we get potholes with accidents and we get ice pockets and people slipping and falling. So they're kind of um, uh, important from a safety perspective. Um, then there are uh, some asks there for uh, electrically related stuff. Um, both Fort River and Wildwood have 50 year old electrical services. Uh, we've put some money into uh, getting them uh, infrared scanned and evaluated and we're doing follow up on that this spring. Um, but with the aging uh, infrastructure there, um, a, a large catastrophe could knock the whole school out for some time to come. Uh, so I want to try to be proactive and, and try to get ahead of the, uh, the most risky areas uh, for that. Um, some of the other uh, asks include um, money for uh, fire alarm systems. Uh, some of our fire alarm panels are giving us more and more trouble uh, with communication problems, um, false alarms, and all nature things. Uh, so we need to do some replacement of some panels there and some upgrade of some of the wiring. Um, and uh, the Crocker Farm roof uh, is uh, a different kind of a project. We have at Crocker Farm uh, some flat roofs and we have some sloped shingled roofs. And the sloped shingled roofs from the um, renovation that we did I don't know, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, um, uh, I think, uh, are having some structural problems. We're getting some shingles lifting. We think that the, that the, it's the result of, of a problem underneath with the roof sheathing. Um, so I'm afraid that in order to keep going, the rain out of those buildings, we're going to have to do some stripping and some uh, some structural repair work. Um, so this is just a general ballpark to get us uh, into the into the area that I think we're going to end up. Um, then there's a few other things that are sort of typical uh, annual for uh, uh, furniture repair repair and replacement for um, the. Um, uh, asbestos management and a few other items, but um, I don't. I, I mean, a lot of this is 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 similar to last year, and probably will be similar to next year. So maybe I should uh, pause and see if there are specific questions about specific projects. So, I'm I'm looking for hands. And just as um, so we just went through Rupert just went through the facility side so maybe take questions on the facility side and then he, um, Rupert can speak to some of the vehicle requests. Oh yes, exactly. If no one else has one, I mean I had some on the both the um, I guess on the wiring and the electrical upgrade. To what extent um, is that just? A basic repairing wires um, or getting system capacity, or is it, can it also um, we can it also handle if the electrical system was upgraded? Could it handle mini splits? Um, some of the other kinds of air filtration things that can be put in walls and are potentially reusable. You know, if you had better wiring and those compressors go outside the building and. I know, you know, that we don't think these buildings will be around for a long time, but you can potentially use those units in another place. So I just didn't have quite a, a sense of what went into the electrical and wiring side. And this is com in combination with Univents. I wasn't sure what Univents were. So I was just looking at a combination of electrical wiring and things called Univents and thinking about um, those are connect or connected um, because they probably run by electricity. But. Sure, I'd be glad to uh, try to answer that question. Uh, well, let's start with the unit, unit events first. Most of our classrooms uh, have their own individual independent ventilation system for heating and cooling. Um, and so it's called a unit ventilator. Uh, some larger classrooms might have two, a cafeteria might have four, uh, but it sort of takes the place of supply fans uh, and uh, heating coils uh, and so forth. The univents that we have are, uh, are aging. Uh, we've talked in the past about trying to replace and upgrade. Um, my assessment of, of that is that the, uh, 
uh, because they're built into the furniture and because uh, uh, the piping is hidden, uh, much of it has uh, asbestos insulation. Um, it would be a huge project to try to completely upgrade. So the money that we're asking for is more for uh, in-place repairs. Um, we have motors and fan wheels that, that, that fall apart, um, dampers that freeze up, uh, actuators uh, that, that, that burn out. Um, so a lot of the unit vent replace and repair is for equipment within the housing that's there, providing ventilation, heating, and cooling for each of the classrooms. Uh, as far as the electrical uh, is concerned, um, the existing services um, probably have capacity for additional ventilation loads um, in terms of how much power is coming into the building. Uh, but but finding a, 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 a there may not be space uh, for to add circuit breakers without some work. Um, I'm more focused on uh, replacing obsolete circuit breakers or uh, panels with circuit breakers that are no longer um, uh, as safe as I would like. Um, and I think, in my mind, those are the the primary focus is the main. Um, uh, just, to, just to try to keep everything as reliable as we can until we can um, move to newer building. Okay, thank does you. That, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Um, Mandy's hand is up and Peter's hand is up. I'm, I'm not sure I saw which first, so I'll just do Mandy first. Peter's was. Okay, Peter. Um, yeah, so two questions, one on the, um, Croc the Crocker Farm roof and the other mm -hmm. on the interior upgrades, ADA. So on, on the Crocker Farm roof, um, it, it's really good to see this on the list. Um, we had a pretty serious situation one plus years ago um, to very, varying degrees of varying points in the seasons, all three schools. So it's, it's, it's good to proactively take care of this. So when, when I look at like the five-year kind of plan, we have, you know, two and a half million for it in FY26. So um, so my, my, my part A question on, on the roof repair is, will, will this get us to, to that point? Is that the idea here? Is that like, let's fix these problems that have been, you know, trickling along and, and we won't have to have, you know, 50 to 100 plus, you know, um, uh, in order to, to do these kinds of repairs in the next five years. Um, and then also, um, you know, you talked about how, because the shingles are lifting, you might have to get in there and do some more foundational work with the sheathing and I'm certainly no roof expert but it's this sounds like one of those problems that like you don't know the full scope of it until you actually get in there and start ripping it up and I see you nodding your head um and uh so I'm wondering that that 250 that's a ballpark is that like a low a medium or a high ballpark right is that like hopefully it's 250 but if we rip it up and it's rat infested it's going to be twice as much or is, it, or is this like a, a conservative maximum I just tr just trying to think about you know um, how that might impact uh, the f future years. Um, sure. Uh, my my sense of it is that uh, that that is ample for the shingled roof portions, which would be uh, the the angled roof over the uh, the front side of the building, and um, the angled roof over the uh, second floor addition, um, where the sixth grades are. Um, I I don't. I don't think that it's uh, it's pessimistic. I think that it's ample. Um, and what you're seeing down the road is for the the rest of the territory. That is the flat roof, uh, which is a big uh, gutter new place because it's eventually going to uh, need need that as well. Um, yeah, I I mean I think I think some corners may have been cut on the construction. Um, I think that the repair is likely going to be uh, not outrageous, just um, nitpicky and time consuming to, to, uh, to tie things together and bridge things that should have been bridged. Um, but I do, obviously, I, mean, I don't know for sure until we, until we lift it, but I think that it's ample. Mandy? Did I answer your questions? I'm sorry. Yeah. Peter? Is that Mandy. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a there's a lot of Univent stuff on here, and uh, 
HVAC equipment and and things like that, um, general HVAC replacements. And and I always have to ask in this new environment when we've been upgrading and replacing and trying to make sure that um, air changes are good and air quality is good because of pandemic. Uh, is any of that type of stuff that's on this plan for next year that you just talked about potentially fundable by COVID funds? And if so, will it, you know, will you apply for it then? Or if we fund it through this, are we going to be barred from applying for it? I know there were so many strict and, and I don't know whether this is even answerable. So, but that's one of my first questions. Um, my second one goes to an out year which is the Crocker Accessible Playground. I think in two fiscal years, it's listed for $200,000. Um, and I just remember that that's fairly new, I thought. Um, and so I'm curious what we need to do to it already um, that is gonna take a couple hundred thousand dollars that it's already showing up on a CIP. <laughs> Those are great questions. Um, I, don't, <clears throat> I don't think I know the answer to the first one, um, it may be that uh, Sean or Doug uh, would have more information about uh, upcoming potential federal funds. Yeah, um, I can hop in real quick. Um, if there's specific, once we get more specifics on the actual things, um, it very well may be CARES eligible. Um, we, I know, for example, this year we bought a lot of HVAC type stuff um, for the schools out of CARES. So yeah, it's, it is possible that some of that could be. Um, Right now, the eligibility for CARES goes through the end of 2021. So, um, so I can connect with Rupert and we can try to dig into that a little more and see um, what pieces of that might be eligible. Excellent. And um, um, so in terms of the, um, the playground down the road, uh, yeah. we have a soft playground surface in the preschool playground but none of the other playgrounds are um, compliant with ADA requirements in terms of accessibility. Uh, so where we have wood chips, where we have uh, hard playground surfaces um, or sand, um, that's not going to uh, cut the mustard down the road. Uh, and so uh, that's, and in all honesty, the, uh, I think it's called the kindergarten playground, the one that's up the hill behind the school uh, is in very bad shape. Um, but we also need to uh, pay some serious attention to uh, what's down in the lower field and the pathway that we use to get there. Uh, that ramp is too steep. It doesn't have pause places. The, the rails are not right. Um, there's a bunch of ADA issues there as well that uh, we need to address eventually. Um, and, and it's worth doing because we're, we're expecting to keep the school for quite some time. So it's, I, I read it as the Crocker Accessible play, Playground, meaning the preschool playground that was just done. Uh, that's right. not what it's referring to. It's referring to the other ones. Crocker playgrounds accessible that aren't. Okay, now it makes more sense. <laughs> cool, awesome. Um, and did I answer your question about uh, other things? I think I missed something. Uh, no, I, think, more stuff? I think that was all. Okay. Okay, a Andy's hand is up. Yeah, <clears throat> a few years ago in JCPC, we. Uh, found a solution for some of the things for Fort River and Wildwood, where we were looking at the possibility of either um, buying equipment that was used, uh, being able to rent equipment if it was short term, because these do have short term, um, uh, we hope, uh, usages now. Um, or uh, being able to uh, uh, have equipment that was available to share to the building that needs it the most in order to reduce costs uh, so that we can preserve funds for the actual project that um, we ultimately care about the most. And have you done that kind of analysis for these uh, equipment related per, uh, requests? Um, yeah, I've been thinking about that. Um, the the, the uh, buy, buying us time with rentals um, certainly makes sense with something like a chiller, uh, which is uh, a six-figure item. 
um, to purchase and not necessarily uh, easy to translate to a new building. Um, a lot of the other stuff is sort of custom built in place and it's hard for me to imagine an easy way to uh, um, to find a rental that, that will uh, take take the place of uh, some failed piece of equipment. Uh, so mostly what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, repair the components. Uh, it becomes more and more expensive as time goes on because more and more things break. Um, but it's still, uh, I think, uh, our best solution. I think rental is difficult. I mean, you can rent you can rent an air handler. You can run ductwork uh, through windows. Um, uh, there are ways that we can do something if we have a catastrophic failure. The the beauty of our elementary schools here is, uh, uh, one of their strengths is the number of unit ventilators, which are standalone units. So typically a catastrophic failure only affects a room instead of the whole school, unless you're talking about the children or the boiler. Um, so I don't know that, that rental is a, is, a, is a cost savings, but I'm certainly willing to look further into it uh, for the uh, ventilation side of things. Does that at least start answering your question? Uh, yes. Doug, Doug, did you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah if I could, please. I, I think that, you know, absolutely the, that's an approach we can take as far as looking at, you know, if, if, and especially around large scale items, as, as uh, Rupert mentioned, relative to like chillers or boilers, that type of thing. I think the other thing that I wanted to uh, note it, you know, for the committee to think about and, and keep in mind is that there are at those two buildings, Wildwood and Fort River in particular, they're, they're 50 year old buildings. Um, and, you know, uh, even with a school project that, that could potentially take one of them down, the other one will be an asset that the town owns. And there are significant uh, capital investment that will be needed in those buildings after that, whether the town chooses to keep the buildings or not keep the buildings, or if they're, you know, whatever, you know, choices the town makes relative to those buildings, uh, the, there are things we're, uh, you know, pushing off outside the sort of five year window right now, um, you know, total roof replacement, uh, more extensive and, and uh, significant electrical upgrades, uh, heating and cooling upgrades. We, we're, we're not attempting those kinds of things. If we were, uh, you know, if the buildings were 20 years old and we weren't in the middle of you know a building project uh those would be in in some of those would be more near term as far as the capital plan um so i just want the committee to think about that is that those kind of things uh are kind of just outside the horizon you're looking at but are are out there and and one of the buildings you know if we're successful in in the in the building project one of those buildings will probably still be remaining and and as a community we're going to have to decide what we want to do with it as an asset and, and what resources we need to to continue to invest in that asset to preserve it. Um, so that's, uh, I just wanna mention that as context for your thinking as far as out years, even beyond the five years you're currently considering in your, in your uh, planning. Thanks, Doug. Um, Peter, is your hand back up or did it just not yeah. go down? Yeah. Yeah, another question if that's right. Okay, Peter. Yeah, um, so on uh, interior upgrades slash ADA, is another big ticket item. Um, uh, can you just talk about what interior upgrades is and and what how much of that is non ADA and then just just to play with the theoretical if you were if that was suddenly cut to 120 would you be able to do the scope of what you want to do with with that or would that seriously curtail the the effort I know that there's additional money on that uh, in out years this is this is the larger one um, so if you could just talk a little bit more about um, where that's going sure um... Uh, interior upgrades is typically a, a, a vast array of smaller projects. Uh, so if we don't have $150,000, um, there may be projects that we don't do, um, but it, it, it wouldn't be the end of my world. Um, it would just be something that gets pushed down the road that we have to address eventually. Um, they include a wide variety of issues um, um, that, for example, in Wildwood, uh, are replacing rugs with tile or um, uh, replacing uh, the ceiling tiles in an area because of um, because of age staining. 
um, and, and things like that. Um, fresh paint when we need it, uh, we end up having uh, just doors and doorways uh, needing repair or replacement, uh, whether it's an interior or an exterior door. Um, light fixtures that fail. Uh, I mean, there's a wide variety of projects that, that we do under that umbrella. Um, um, I don't, um, I'm not sure. Um, let me see if let me see if that's enough of an answer. If you want more, uh, no. I mean that's good. I'm, I'm just I'm thinking about. I mean, I remember the origin of the ADA study where mm -hmm. we identified through a lot of our buildings things that we really want to do and and we had an urgent need to do, and yet it was way too much for a, one single capital year. And so, for a couple of years now, we've been kicking the can down the road on on that and. And we have this, you know, I just have to call it out. We have this, you know, this kind of existential problem with, with how much, and Doug and Andy just kind of brought it up a little bit about to what degree we invest in quality of life for students and staff at Fort River and Wildwood. Yeah. Um, it's like, even for things that, that aren't going to be reusable after those buildings go away, you know, knock on wood, um, you know, the staff and students are still working and living in them, <laughs> working and learning in them, sorry. Um, <laughs> and so, right, so to, what, so to what degree do we want to invest in order to improve that? It's a not, it's a not answerable question really, but um, it is still something we've struggled with on school committee a little bit in terms of, you know, exactly when we, 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 we up the level of um, cap available capital funds to do things okay. like major AD up ADA upgrades, which, and when we do some of these, you know, we we have great anecdotal stories back um, about the, the the value of that, you know, and it has real impact, not on a large number, but on a for a small number of you know students and staff can have a pretty big impact. So I was just more curious about like major projects in the offing and and whatnot. Okay. Uh, if I may, um, so uh, there's a couple of major expenses on the ADA side that I didn't mention uh, that we're that we're grappling with. Um, Accessibility in terms of sidewalks and uh, um, problems with, with unevenness, uh, trip hazards, um, uh, wheelchair access, all those things add up and um, they, they could easily, you know, we could spend, we spend all that money just on that in some of the schools. I'm not proposing that we do just that, but we do want to make improvements on that front. Um, and in addition, uh, we've targeted uh, at Wildwood and and Fort River, uh, some particular uh, accessible bathroom issues. Uh, right now, there's a study uh, that's being done, and we're um, we're we've, we've received uh, uh, some preliminary uh, ideas from KMA, uh, which hopefully we will get to uh, to put out to bid eventually. Um, it's a summer project. I don't think we're going to get to it this summer, just because of the, the way things are going. I think that would be next summer, but uh, we're, we're looking at um, in Wildwood and Fort River uh, making uh, accessible bathrooms in the uh, uh, rooms A and B uh, for some of the special programs and in the nurse's office, um, which will make a huge difference in a lot of people's lives. Um, but it's a big structural effort. Um, and so it's just going through the design process and our target is the summer of uh, 22. There'll be an FY23 project. Um, uh, and I hope to have more information about that in the next uh, few months. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions on this set. Sean, so we can probably move to the next. So, Rupert, do you want to just go through the vehicles, um, the few vehicles that are on the list for the schools? Yeah, I'm trying to find them on my, I have too many windows in my computer. Um, why do they not show up in this document? So it's a van and a bus. Van right, bus. so, so um, yeah, we have, uh, we have targets on our buses. Um, Typically, uh, we try to replace our school buses uh, when they have 10 years or 100,000 miles. Um, and uh, we've got 
Uh, and we typically we try to keep uh, two spare buses so that if one is down and one's on a field trip, we can still function fully. Um, both of our spares have uh, something like 130,000 miles on them. Um, well, 100, 120 plus, let's just put it that way. I'm not sure the exact number right now. Um, I don't remember it. Uh, but we need to stay in the habit of replacing those buses. Uh, I know this has been a hot topic in the past and the questions about electrical buses has come up and I'm happy to discuss that. Uh, but before be, before I surrender the microphone, um, we also have uh, uh, vans for uh, transporting special needs kids. And uh, out of our fleet of those, we have several that are high mileage and uh, quite old that we need to replace, as well as uh, one of our plow trucks is really just being held together with, with with welding, well, welding repairs and duct tape. Um, so we have a number of, of uh, vehicle requests that are fairly urgent and I, for some reason, <coughs> can't get my document to pop up to get the details. And I'll just say on the special ed vans, um, one was on the list for last year I think, I believe, and then one was this year. And since last year's, you know, wasn't really funded that whole year, that's why there's two special ed vans this year. Usually there's only sort of one at a time. That's that's right, yes, thank you. Um, well, let me see if I can just reopen it. There it is. Down, down to vehicles. Here we go. Sorry, I was sort of shooting blind there. Okay. Andy has his um, hand raised. I don't know if you want hey, to. Andy. Questions. Yeah, I'm just. It is predictable that. We'll have at least one counselor who's going to raise the electric bus issue. Right. So probably worth uh, having some report on where that stands right now, as far as uh, grant availability and uh, how costs have uh, fared in that option. Oh, my memory wasn't bad. I was shooting from the hip, but that's what's in the document. Sorry. Um, uh, yes, so uh, the story on electrical buses is still a, a question of range um, and the smaller question of reliability. Um, the, when you have a vehicle that takes six hours to charge, um, you really are limited in, in what you can do if, you, if you're draining the battery down to 20% every time you use it. Uh, and school buses are still problematic in that regard. Um, I personally, I, I own an electric vehicle. I drive an electrical vehicle. I believe in electrifying our, our, our vehicles as much as we can. Uh, but school buses are problematic because of the range problem and because of the expense. An electric bus costs three times, three to four times what a, a conventional bus costs. Um, while its maintenance costs are generally lower, um, uh, you're, you're faced with a battery replacement halfway through its life, which costs more than another bus. Uh, so financially, it's quite problematic. Um, and then the range problem just makes it really difficult for us to function with, uh, with a large fleet that had electrical buses on it. Um, that said, um, there are things that, that, that I think we all ought to be thinking about. Um, um, building out the infrastructure with chargers um, uh, that do the quick charging, the level three uh, direct DC charging uh, is something worth doing, but it requires uh, a large investment of money only. They, they need a 480 volt three phase service uh, and then they are close to uh, $100,000 to install plus your service. So having fast chargers um, would help us 
make our, our fleet more nimble. Um, there are some grants out there, but there, there, there are stipulations on the grants that I've looked at, which say that uh, if you're using this money to subsidize your uh, fast level three charger, uh, you have to promise to make it publicly available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that sort of defeats the purpose of installing it in order to make an electric bus more usable uh, because we can't count on being able to charge it. So that's that's kind of a stumbling block. I'm still trying to chase that down. Um, um, on, and on the other side, um, I think it might be possible to look into uh, electric or hybrid vehicles for pupil vans um, or for uh, service vehicles. Um, I'm a little worried about uh, how a hybrid vehicle would perform for a plow truck because of uh, the wear and tear that that puts on things. Uh, but it's something that I am open to, to looking into further. And I'll just add quickly to what Rupert just said. Um, Dave, Z, and I actually had a meeting scheduled today with ChargePoint to look into just what Rupert mentioned, which was um, some grants and other opportunities to put in more charging stations. Um, unfortunately, that meeting was rescheduled, so we will have more information on that um, at a future date, but we are looking into that. Mandy. Yeah, so a couple of questions. Um, I was concerned about the fact that electric wasn't really mentioned for the vans um, at all. Um, we know there's electric buses out there and you just explained some of that. Um, Follow-ups on the electric buses are, you know, the bus we have that is electric is, is one of, it, I, my understanding is it's one of the sort of first generation electric buses that, that was produced in some sense. And so the technology over the time has gotten better. Um, so are we still basing our concerns and range issues and, and all of that and repair numbers and maintenance numbers on our experience with the electric bus we have or on experiences that other districts have had with electric buses that can be bought now? Because um, I presume the issues are different. Um, my, my next question, and, and then it would be, did you look into the possibility of electric for the sped vans and the accessible vans? Um, and if so, what are the cost differences and, and what would be preventing us from buying an electric vehicle there if they exist? And then finally, I know we sometimes, you know, we have two districts and what I don't quite understand is, um, and so I always ask this is, are these vans just used to transport K to six or pre-K to six students? Is the bus used just to transport pre-K to six students? And is the maintenance fleet, this truck that's on the list, used just at the three elementary schools? Um, and, and depending on what that answer is, I might have a follow-up question. All right, let me see if I can remember all your questions. So um, in terms of uh, advancement in electric technology, uh, there have not been significant advancements in battery technology, which is the major constraint that I was talking about, which is range and charging time. Um, as companies gain experience, their reliability records will improve. Um, there are now a couple of uh, national uh, companies uh, starting their first year of electric buses. I would just as soon prefer not to buy a first year electric bus again if we can help it. Um, uh, and I think that, that you know, they'll have their own reliability bugs to work out um, over, over a year or two. Um, but really it's gonna, it's gonna depend on uh, either uh, changes in battery technology or massive infrastructure in fast charging uh, to make it really a viable option for our transportation needs. At, uh, for a bus. Um, in terms of uh, pupil vans, the vast majority, uh, so the pupil vans uh, end up being used both region and district. Um, um, most of our, pu our, of our pupil vans are uh, operating just within the town of Amherst. Uh, to deliver AMR students either to uh, the elementary schools or the secondary schools where needed. Um, but I can't 
in all honesty, say that it's ex entirely exclusive. And what about the maintenance vehicle? So the, ma the maintenance vehicles, uh, we have some maintenance vehicles that are owned by the region and some maintenance vehicles that are owned by, by, uh, by town of Amherst schools. Um, uh, and they do end up uh, working both areas. Um, where, we're, where we're plowing, we, we, we ended up doing plowing and sidewalk work or landscape work or picking up limbs and trees uh, or delivering uh, things in pickup trucks um, to all the schools. So I guess my next question for all of that would be, you know, at, even if a resident of Amherst is using an accessible van, if they're seven to 12, that's a different district and the costs should be coming out of a district, different district. So my question would be, do the district share the costs for purchasing these vehicles? Does, does Amherst Elementary School get the benefit of using accessible vans that were purchased by the region? Um, it sounds like on the maintenance side that, that Amherst Elementary Schools get the benefit of using maintenance vehicles that were purchased by the region. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how we do or do not um, mesh those funds um, since they are separate budgets how do we account for the actual separateness of those budgets and are we as a town taxpayer ensuring that we're not subsidizing three other towns by purchasing things in Amherst that are that the three other towns in the region are getting the benefit of There's a lot of bookkeeping in this that I may not have the answers for you now. Um, uh, and I'm happy to try to get you some more answers. Um, in, in general, um, uh, I can say that uh, the major uh, expenses, uh, operating expenses for the vehicles is fuel. And, and uh, uh, we are very careful uh, of tracking which vehicle is owned by who and who pays for the fuel for those vehicles. Um, so the, in the big picture, the biggest expense is uh, we try to be very careful about keeping our buckets of money separate and responsibility separate. Doug. So just to, to add to that, and, and perhaps uh, Sean could, could chime in as well, because he's uh, experienced in that as well. Um, so that, you know, there are a number of ways in which we share costs across the district. Um, actually across all three districts, including Pelham. And, and so, you know, we're, we, we uh, are required to report to the state our transportation costs, uh, including, you know, uh, depreciation on vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, those, those get reported and shared across the districts. And so there are ways in which, um, while not directly always uh, supporting Amherst in, in the capital arena, there are other ways in which, uh, you know, the region is supporting uh, Amherst relative to these kind of things. So, for example, all of the staff, uh, all the drivers are region employees. Uh, so, as such, their their costs are largely and and you know we have a, a, a you know a mechanism for recording the time they spend for Amherst or Pelham and re region and trying to uh, uh, divvy those costs up and report those to the state. We're required to report those to the state. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's some imprecision in that to some extent, and and there are other ways in which the the region uh, funds and does work for the for Amherst relative to uh, non transportation things that also support Amherst in ways in which uh, uh, aren't fully and, and precisely accounted for. So I think there's there's a little uh, there's a point with the accounting where you get the the cost of of figuring it out isn't worth the difference in the price. Uh, if you know what I mean, um, and not to be flip about it, I don't mean to uh, diminish the, the question because it is a legitimate one about uh, something as expensive as a vehicle. Um, but I think that there are a number of ways in which we're trying to account for those those costs across multiple districts and, and, and keep a, uh, an eye on that uh, relative to, to having each district support each other, maybe not as uh, directly on this particular item, but in other ways to, to help balance that out. Um, but hopefully Mr. McGonagall can add a little more detail there as well. Yeah, I can add a, f a few. Um, so I think for these 
two particular vans, we would want to look at what is the primary use. Um, that's normally how we've made that dis, uh, decision in the past is what is the primary use of the vehicle. Um, there's lots of sharing that goes on just because of the nature of having one central office and one facility department, one transportation department. Um, but most of the vans or many of the vans are used for preschool transportation primarily. And so that's why many of them have been bought out of Amherst in the past. So I think for these two particular vans, um, Doug and Rupert, it would be helpful to know again, what is the primary purpose of these vans? If they are again for preschool as their primary function, then I think it makes sense for it to stay here. Um, if any of them again are you know going to be focused more on the region, then I, I agree with Mandy Joe, and, and maybe we want to put that through the region capital plan. Um, so I, I think that would be the thing to go back and look is what is the primary purpose of these two vans, and, and for that matter, the the maintenance vehicle. Um, Again, the maintenance vehicles, there are some region owned ones and some Amherst owned ones. So it's sort of a split, but we'd want to look at that too. Sure, we can do that. And, and I, I think the, uh, to the uh, earlier question relative to, to looking at the vans, because you know, uh, pasture vehicles uh, are, are decidedly more advanced in, you know, as far as uh, uh, EV. Um, they're, they're, they've been on the market longer. They're much more sophisticated. Um, there's a uh, greater and greater, you know, capacity and, and opportunity to, to purchase because there's just more variety there. The one thing I will say about that is, is relative to the vans that hold, that transport these children, uh, there are state regulations that we have to comply with. So the, the vans have to meet what's called 7D requirements um, around handicap service to, to kids. Um, and that's when we start to have a narrowing of, of the options. Um, but absolutely, we'll look at, at you know, because again, the other thing with passenger size vehicles like the, the vans um, is that, you know, that market's much more mature, but, but uh, and, be, and because of that, there's, there's likelihood that there are more, uh, there are options for compliant vans that, that fit that EV or hybrid um, option. So we'll certainly look at those as we, as we go out to, to purchase these and see if there's an option that, that makes sense for us that way. And, and so, uh, and and price-wise, you know, with the, the maturing of the market, the, the EV vehicles are are comparable in price to gas vehicles, and so you know, hopefully the, the price will not be too you know different. And and yet the uh, uh, the real key thing is that it's got to meet the requirements that are necessary for that type of transportation. So I think I I think that's it. You know, I just Doug, I know you know this, but you're thinking of when, uh, when I was back and forth to New York City, these vans are also used by hospitals um, for handicap access. So, so there is a, a large, there's a large, potentially a pretty large market that schools and this, which is I think why there may be more availability because you, you're not just targeting it for um, a niche market. There, it's, a, it's a pretty big market. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions on this or hands up. Um, so I think we can move to next. All right, so I'll, I'll thank Doug and Rupert. You guys can hang around if you want to. Um, but next up is Dave and Chris for conservation and planning. Dave, do you want me to um, pull up those uh, pictures that you sent? Sure, that would be great, Sean, and I, I can try to roll through that. I, I did not put together a PowerPoint, but I have a couple of just prompting images uh, just to talk through with you. And and Kathy or Sean, our main focus here tonight on, on conservation is really there's just three items, correct? Uh, we're just talking about the vehicles and then uh, buffers bond. And then I think there's some money in the out years that you want me to talk about as well. And the, and the one thing, Dave, I would add, and maybe we can uh, teamwork this, is um, the money for sustainability improvements. Sure. Um, and we can add to that. But why let me don't we hold, Yeah, why don't we hold that until the end? And then, um, you know, I know Chris wants to talk about uh, some planning money. So, yeah, really quickly, just a little bit of a contextual, uh, uh, just add a couple of, of uh, slides here and with some, some images. Um, so, overall, um, Conservation, um, we have two staff, two field staff members in conservation. So I uh, wanted to just orient you a little bit. There's about 2,400 acres of land in conservation uh, in town. 
And uh, all of that is managed uh, through my office and uh, with our two staff, our full-time staff. We maintain 80 miles of trails. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, many of those. They're getting a tremendous amount of use here during the, during the pandemic. And that's wonderful to see so many people out there. And I was just talking to uh, uh, some folks who use the trails a lot today, and they were really impressed by how many people are, are adhering to the social distancing uh, requirements and also wearing masks. So it's great to see people out there. We also maintain about 300 acres of open field habitat, and that is not in addition to the 2,400 acres, but that's within that, that uh, broad number. Um, it includes uh, year-round care and administration of Puffer's Pond, a, a very busy place that sees thousands of people uh, visit it uh, every year. And then we have about 50 plus, I actually don't know the count, but we have bridges of all types from you know, five feet long to 25 to 30 feet long. And in fact, uh, one of our projects uh, this year is to replace the bridge uh, at Amethyst Brook. That is a very popular bridge. And we're actually getting a, uh, 50 foot telephone poles to uh, span the Amethyst Brook to replace a bridge that's been out, uh, was washed away by uh, uh, a big January storm and an ice storm back in uh, 2018. Um, we, uh, we have uh, lots of volunteers that uh, work with conservation and then we hire a small summer staff as well. You can keep sc scrolling, Sean. Um, you know, what most people think about conservation land is beautiful views, wonderful trails, vistas. Uh, here's um, here's uh, Mount Pollux, uh, certainly, if not the most popular conservation area in town, one of them in the top three. And it is all beautiful, but um, it does take time, energy, money, and people to care for it. And most of that, most of that work really involves people management. Um, we do a lot of uh, habitat management and, and uh, vegetation management, but um, people um, can be challenging and they bring uh, dogs and they bring horses and, um, and ATVs and, and trash. So all of that takes uh, money, time and energy and focus to keep these areas beautiful and clean and healthy. And you can keep scro scrolling, Sean, thanks. Um, and sometimes we get surprises out there. Like in 2020, um, somebody decided to put their, um, their hot tub, uh, they backed down a road and, and deposited a, a full uh, complete hot tub on conservation land. So uh, we, need to, we need to maintain our boundaries. We need to um, sometimes uh, remove things that end up when people do illegal dumping. And we need to make sure that people respect those boundaries and, and respect the land that um, all of the residents of Amherst through the years have paid for it, both to buy or as uh, get as gifts or um, you know uh, uh, put tax dollars toward maintaining. So it's really important for people to understand that these lands belong to all of us. Keep scrolling, that'd be great. As I said, Puffer's Pond is certainly in the top three most popular places in, in town uh, from, from a conservation standpoint. I love the second slide here with the, uh, if you can keep going, Sean, with the uh, oversized potato chip bag. I'd never seen that before. Um, that was a first on the, on the uh, shores of Puffer's Pond. Um, you know, particularly uh, last year in 2020, we had a wonderful experience up there with uh, really meeting and greeting people during the pandemic, um, doing a lot of social distancing work, and we're hoping to, um, using CARES Act money, uh, repeat that for this year and, and keep people safe up there. We teamed up with DPW last year to really redo the um, uh, State Street and all the parking there and, and try to bring some order to parking. So on our capital list are uh, two vehicles. Um, our vehicles, current vehicles are 16 and 12 years old respectively. Um, these vehicles are used as you can see here to haul material, pull equipment, trailers, uh, of course carry staff and volunteers in the summer. They're used to plow uh, parking areas or conservation areas during the winter. And neither one of them, uh, they're working trucks. I should say that. I really want to emphasize these are working trucks. They're not trucks simply used to move people. They move a lot of stuff. And because we build stuff, we maintain stuff um, out there in the conservation land. And currently, they're not safe. 
Uh, they barely pass inspection and they've been on the capital list for a number of years. Um, and we've been spending far too much money on main, maintaining these two old trucks. I mean, if you think about it, I'm not sure how many people keep their, their vehicles, particularly working vehicles, 16 and 12 years old. So we have one Chevy, which you just saw, and then there's Dodge. And, and these are the type of things they do. They are full of things. They're full of equipment, um, materials when we build things, and then, of course, uh, removing trash and other other things when there's blowdowns and whatnot. You can keep sc scrolling, Sean. Thanks. Here's just more material, be it organic stuff that needs to come off trails or or um, uh, go to um, go to um, uh, the transfer station or what have you. You can keep going. Thank you. Oh, we 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 got the the hot tub twice there. Sorry about that. <laughs> and then, you know, we're, uh, the staff is very creative. Here's um, a couple of our staff working with a volunteer to actually, um, what they did was they, they harvested timbers up in the watershed. Um, I believe this is white oak. And um, they actually milled uh, the lumber trying to do a sustainable kiosk. And I believe this is at Puffer's Pond. And they, uh, this gentleman volunteered to make a kiosk for Puffer's Pond. And they milled all the, the locally grown uh, timber and then put it up at Buffer's Pond. A lot of uh, field mowing. This is uh, uh, our, our newer tractor. Um, and again, the trucks that you saw previously need to haul this tractor around all over town when we need to use it, either the bucket on the front or the brush hog on the back. Lots of bridges. This is a new uh, boardwalk that is trying to get people out of wetland areas in Lawrence Swamp. This is a couple thousand feet long. Uh, we do all of this work. Uh, we permit all of this work through the Conservation Commission. But again, these trucks need to be full of lumber. Uh, we try to buy as much lumber as we can locally through Coles um, and Leader. Um, so yeah, and I think there's maybe one more slide. Yeah, and I'll just finish up at Puffer's Pond. This is these are kind of drone images of Puffer's Pond, and um, um, one of the requests on our capital list is money to um, really we're gonna we're gonna use consultants um, to to come in and help us to uh, come up with a plan to uh, repair the dike at Puffer's Pond. Most people don't realize that Puffer's Pond has the dam. Everyone's familiar with the dam, how beautiful it is. Uh, we have to do annual, uh, uh, excuse me, um, I think it's every other year, every two years we do a, we hire um, uh, specialist engineers to look at uh, that dam. We do this to all of our dams all over town. DPW uh, uh, brings in uh, experts on dam safety and the state requires us to maintain all of our dams uh, in a particular, depending on, uh, whether they're a, a low, moderate, or high hazard. A uh, buffer spawn happens to be a high hazard dam. And there's actually a dike, uh, uh, an overflow area. If, if there was ever issues with the, the water getting too high, there is an area to the north of the dam, and it's very subtle. Um, and there's, there's a house on the property, and the state has, is now requiring us to repair that dike. So I did put in a small amount of money to get us started on doing the analysis and the engineering to repair that dike. I don't think the, the repairs are gonna be a large amount, but it's something that is gonna take quite a bit of study and permitting to get through. So I think those are the last images. Um, happy to take questions again. Um, looking for really working trucks to replace a 16 year old and 12 year old vehicles. They, this request, I, I think I've had this on the capital list probably for three to five years at least. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of the out years if, if you'd like to, Sean or Kathy. Um, or... Mandy's hand is up. Yeah, I actually have a question on something you didn't talk about. Um, station road buildings. Right. You had a septic removal and roof repairs on 15,000 for the septic removal and 40,000 for roof repairs for this year. Um, 
I get to drive by that building all the time. <laughs> and, and I've noticed there's a lot of vehicles there and, and that was mentioned. And so I'm curious, it sounds like we're storing vehicles in some of the barns down on the Station Road farm, um, both conservation vehicles and it sounded like DPW built vehicles. So my question regarding the roof repairs and I guess the building in general is long-term, is this something we're thinking of keeping as a vehicle storage place that might allow us to build a smaller DPW building? Um, yeah, and my apologies. Um, I might be looking at a, a slightly dated um, spreadsheet um, in front of me. Um, so yeah, let me speak to both of those. So um, probably, I'm going to say close to 20 years ago, the town purchased the, the, the land that currently has the two horse farms on the north side of Station Road. I'll just focus on the one to the east uh, that is closest to the rail trail parking lot um, and the, the uh, railroad itself. Um, so for about 20 years, uh, the conservation department um, maintained that property. Um, we actually leased it out to a couple of equestrian um, uh, businesses for a number of years. Um, and eventually about two years ago or so, um, we, we were in discussions with the, 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 the company, the, the business that was leasing that land from us, that, that building in the land. And it really became evident that um, without equity in the land, it was just not a good business decision for them to, to up that again. Um, we also found that even though there were requirements in the lease to improve the building and maintain the building and maintain the um, fencing, that they really, I guess the short answer is there's not a lot of money in equestrian uh, operations in this area. Um, and it's, it's a very slim margin and they, they just could not put the money into it. So um, Guilford Mooring and I have been talking, had been talking and what we decided to do was at that time, um, even though conservation had, had maintained the leases and relationships and the, the back land for many, many years, we decided that with all the um, uh, projects on, the, on, the, on, on our plates, including Groff Park, Kendrick Park, um, that we would use that as a staging area for the equipment deliveries. So we actually use the barn that does have a leaky roof and, and some problems with, with uh, uh, moisture and whatnot, but it was not detrimental to the things we were keeping there. So we stored all of the material for Golf Park, the, the, uh, both the playground and the um, spray park. And then we also did the same for uh, Kendrick Park. And even with those materials in the building, we were also able to get some of our equipment that normally would be sitting outside at the yard at DPW or the yard at conservation uh, into that building for the winter. Um, it is not meant for that. The clearances are not meant for that. Um, so um, again, Guilford and I, you know, have had conversations that, you know, a modest investment in that roof um, would allow us to continue to use that building in the interim for the, the very things we're doing now. I, I, for a variety of reasons, the current building would not suffice for a long-term DPW storage or anything like that. It's a highly sensitive ecological area because it's right on the banks of the, of the uh, Hop Brook, which is um, estimated habitat, priority habitat, and all of the above, um, as is much of Amherst. Um, the reason we put in money for the septic system is that we actually want to close out the system that is there. There's a tight tank. There is um, a bathroom there. Um, and we need to remove all of that system. We have no intention of having a bathroom there. Um, I think you have seen some vehicles there, and that is we are allowing uh, local co contractors who are doing work in Amherst to uh, use it as kind of a, a home base. We also will, would like to use it as a staging area for the Station Road Bridge because it's outside of the riverfront and ecological, the, the, the closest ecologically sensitive areas right along the brook. So we would stage the, the, uh, the Station Road Bridge project there. Thank you.
Um, any other questions? Um, I have a question on the vehicles. Um, and it, it's, it's mainly we, we're, we've got a long list of vehicles, Dave, not just yours. So the price for a one ton truck is different on your list than it is on Guilford's list. And amazingly, his is less expensive, which is not the typically the way it goes. So, so I, I, I'm just wondering when we are buying these, do we do those cross comparisons? I'm, you know, I don't know exactly how many variants there are in a one ton truck and then the other truck, but um, I was just, I then looked at Ford's hybrid truck that's a smaller version when you were showing that. And it's not as expensive as some of the prices you're showing. So I know one is the big truck and the other is the smaller truck. So there's some of these new vehicles coming on the line and a year from now, there'll be an electric one, but right now they definitely have hybrids. So it's a question about the, the two trucks and price comparisons when, we, when we're buying or do departments just buy their own truck? You know, um, you know, on a, on, on getting a good deal. And then the only other one I had just on what Mandy was asking about the barn, learning that there is a toilet there and you're removing the toilet and removing the septic tank. Um, there was a recent article on the U.S. is quite unique on there are no public toilets anywhere. Um, it's the scarcity of them. And I'm just, is, is it usable at all for uh travelers or you've just decided it's too risky to leave it there so but that's a, a separate question i'm more well, let me familiar. handle that one first um this is you know this was built as a horse farm during the 1980s it is not ada it is no one on this call would want to use that restroom okay. uh, i can guarantee you that um now or anytime in the future um it is extremely old, um, moisture has damaged it through the years. It, it's a okay. barn, it's a barn bathroom. And the there is no septic system there. The groundwater is so high, there's a tight tank. And without going into great detail, we believe that tight tank has failed. So it's, it's a problem okay. that we need to address because we own the land and we need to kind of button that all up and be done with it. Okay. So it's, um, I would be really hesitant to say we want to put a public bathroom there that close to the rail trail and then take responsibility for that long term. I think uh, DCR has in the past, and I'm not sure, I can't quite visualize, but in the past they have had a porta potty at the trailhead there at uh, the rail trail at Station Road. And I think that's a better solution given uh, the high water table there and that the land won't perk. Um, which is part of having a, you know, a, a functioning uh, septic system. Um, Kathy, good questions about the trucks. Um, I would be happy to check our price estimates with Guilford. Um, I think the, the, the number that we have in there is, is pretty solid, but I'm happy to check that with Guilford. I do know that, um, and, and I'll, I'll do some comparison, it really depends on what you're adding to the truck um, and, and that those features um, can add considerable prices. I think Guilford's probably around $65,000, 60 to 65. No, it's not that much, no, he had one at 80 um, and his was a one ton truck with a plow. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the combined, you know, so I don't know yeah. whether, you know, so I, I just happened to notice because they both said one ten trucks. I don't know. Yeah. I really so don't I, know enough about trucks to know. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think this is right in that same ballpark, and, and it's basically we're looking for the same thing. And just a reminder on vehicle, all the vehicles, um, they'll either be competitively bid, where we would put out a solicitation and get three quotes, uh, or three three bids if it's over 50000 Um which this one is, or we would look to a state contract which competitively bid um, that vehicle. So, it, you know, we don't go on a like, you know, a auto trader or something and, and price it out. We, we would put together specifications and, um, and then we would solicit competitive bids. Yeah. And on the smaller truck, we'd be happy to look at a hybrid. Um, my only caution is really, and, and I was listening to Rupert talk about um, Rupert and Doug talk about um, um, buses. My only caution there is I, I don't really wanna be a leader in um, 
and picking some of the first commercial hybrid or commercial um, all electric uh, Ford or Chevy trucks. Um, I, I can't emphasize enough that these are off road vehicles. They spend most of their time on woods roads and in the mud and um, uh, they're, they're not, they don't spend that much time on pavement. So um, these are gonna have to be very robust vehicles. And, and I just wanna make sure that if we were to go with a hybrid or a, an EV truck that they are meant to be doing that. Right, you know, the, the hybrids have been out longer, but I don't, I don't know what their track record is for this kind of work. Yeah, but and the question, I literally just Googled what does one yeah. cost. So it um, that yeah, and we we certainly will look at that. And um, I think the other thing with the hybrids is can, what is their hauling capacity? Can they haul a trailer with a tractor on the back? Yeah, and and I don't know the tonnage there, but uh, we can we can talk. But I think I think the eighty five that we have in here for the one ton is is pretty consistent with where Guilford is with with his one ton as well. So we have two other projects. We have the um, housing production plan, which I think we would go, we'll go to next. Okay. Hello, I'm Chris Brestrup. You probably all have seen me before. Um, so I, I have two projects to talk to you about. The housing production plan, um, we have a, a number in there of $30,000 to um, update the housing production plan. We have a housing production plan that was um, finished in 2013. Um, they're generally good for five years. Um, this, they're a, um, something that is um, asked for by the state. So the state looks at it and, and agrees that you've done a good job. So the state agreed that we had done a good job with our last housing production plan, but it did expire in 2018. So um, what we'd like to do is um, update the housing production plan. I think we had a number in our um, FY21 budget of $20,000, but when I spoke with Nate Malloy recently, he thought it would be more in the um, vicinity of $30,000 to have this um, plan updated. Um, we would probably, um, well, Sean would tell us what we needed to do as far as um, obtaining consultant services. Um, I would be inclined to hire the people who did the original housing production plan because they have all of our information and they've worked with us on other projects. But of course, we have to do everything according to the proper bidding um, requirements. Um, but that is an important item. If you have a housing production plan, you can check the box on your grant application and say, yes, you've done it. And it gives you certain points. And we are, um, now that we have Ben Brigger with us, we're like a powerhouse with getting grants. So we want to keep that track record going. And this would be one of the key uh, items that we'd like to have in our, um, in our toolbox. Um, the other thing about it is that it gives us some sense of, um, you know, what should our goals be with regard to producing affordable housing units. And um, that's really what the housing production plan is all about. It tells us, um, you know, over a five year period, how many um, affordable units should we be producing every year. And um, the last housing production plan said we should be producing 48 affordable housing units a year. And, and we do work very hard to um, get money from CPA and from the state and um, from all the sources we can and work with private developers to produce affordable units. Um, we haven't quite met the 48 units a year yet, but um, we're working towards it. And um, so I hope that you will uh, agree with this amount of money to um, hire a consultant to do this housing production plan. Do you have any questions about this? I don't, I'm looking around the room. It doesn't look like it. Mandy does. It's not really a question. And I know I have plenty of opportunity as a chair of the CRC to talk to you about this, but um, as the council works on its housing, uh, comprehensive housing policy, I would just ask that hopefully we'll pass that at some point this year, that that somehow be worked into or given to the consultants or something when that gets done for consideration. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Okay, are you ready to hear about the second item? <laughs> the second item is a little bit bigger. Um, and those of you who have been involved in our zoning efforts um, have probably heard something about this. 
Um, we did have uh, $40,000 for um, downtown and gateway planning and zoning. And I think that was money from many years ago. Maybe it was even from 2013. Um, I've been told by accounting that I really can't hold on to that money any longer. Um, we did ask for uh, another sum in FY21, um, $60,000. And I was expecting to match that with the 40,000 to come up with $100,000 to hire a consultant to help us with our zoning efforts. We've heard again and again that um, People would really like to see an effort made to make the streetscape more appealing in downtown Amherst, wider sidewalks, more trees, uh, that type of thing. We've also heard again and again that people want um, design guidelines in, uh, in the buildings that are built in the downtown. And we've also been studying the limited business district next to the downtown. So these are issues that have come up um, many times. Um, we also need help with things like parking and trying to figure out how we can change our parking zoning bylaw to be more in keeping with the pressures that we're feeling lately as far as development. When our municipal parking district was developed, um, it started off in the, in I think it was 1969, um, and we felt that um, there wasn't enough uh, business in the downtown and we wanted to give businesses a break by not requiring them to have on-site parking. And that was really related to restaurants and stores. Um, then in the mid 2000s, we changed our municipal parking district to allow um, residential development to happen in the downtown without um, having on-site parking. And that was prior to any residential development being built in the downtown. Now we've seen a, a, a real um, you know, surge of, of downtown residential development in the form of mixed use buildings. And those buildings are not required to have any on-site parking. So we'd like to um, work with the consultant to figure out how can we um, adjust our zoning to um, require the right amount of parking if that's the right thing to do so that we can um, move forward and still allow development in the downtown and the adjacent limited business district. So all of these things um, we really need to have consultants help with. Um, we also have a, a lot of problems with our sign bylaw. So that's another thing that we really um, can use help with on in, in zoning. So, um, you know, we're, we're doing this big effort to overhaul our zoning bylaw, um, sort of fix all the things that are that we recognize are wrong with it and try to put together a, a zoning bylaw that will carry us into the future. And these are things that we need to have um, outside help on. Another thing that um, an outside consultant can do is to once we get out of the COVID phase and we're able to meet in uh, person in public again, um, you know, potentially run um, public forums to find out what people want in the downtown. This is another thing that we keep hearing from uh, people who come to our planning board meetings and the CRC meetings is that, how are we sure of what we really want in the downtown? We haven't explored it since we explored it in, in 2017. We had two downtown forums, but that process was not um, concluded and we didn't have a report come out of it. And we also have a master plan that tells us we want to focus development in the downtown, but, but we haven't had much um, help with um, interaction with the public and trying to figure out what they want. So we think that, um, you know, being able to hire a consultant to help us with planning and zoning for our downtown would really be beneficial, uh, especially with this effort to uh, rewrite the zoning bylaws. So I hope that you will um, go along with our request. Um, the request is for $100,000. Do you have any questions about this? I do after Mandy. I don't have a question. I just thought for the benefit of the JCPC members that aren't on the council that I would mention that the council has passed a priority um, to spend consultant money on form based zoning and design guidelines. And I think this is this request comes partially out of that that council vote. Mm -hmm. Hey, Peter. I was just curious, like how um, would, would the um... How would this funding be envisioned to work with like community outreach coordinator and, and, and other, there's like a number of related things that, um, that the town wants to engage the public on. Right now we have the full capital projects, for example. Um, but um, 
but just in terms of like you know public engagement on on different major changes in the town is this do you envision this as like an isolated sort of project it starts up it's done or is it is it related to some of the other um more permanent things that go on I think the results of it will be more permanent, but um, I have um, participated in a process in Northampton where they have hired um, Dodson Flinker and Associates, and they are um, really excellent at leading public uh, meetings and um, eliciting from the public. Do you like this building? Do you like that building? What kind of streetscape do you want to see? Do you like wide sidewalks or narrow sidewalks? Do you want to see parallel parking in your village center or your downtown? All of these things, it's it's easier for an outside consultant to lead this kind of um, event. Um, what what I have experienced here is when I try to lead this kind of event, people look at me and say, "You put that building downtown, and we don't like that building, and so we're not going <laughs> to listen to you, and we're not going to answer you in a normal way." But if you have a consultant from out of town, they have to be polite to that consultant, and they will give the consultant. Um, People shouldn't be mean to you. That's terrible. <laughs> so that's uh, that's my pitch for an outside consultant. Paul was there at our um, most recent downtown forum, which uh, was was challenging. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so Chris, I have a question that sort of um, well dovetails with Peter a little bit, but no, it's more. I think this is a terrific idea, so the project. So my question is, um, seeing that there's a major new developer with a project proposed for downtown that's before the planning board, um, if we don't have a moratorium or a little lull space asking how wide we want the sidewalks to be, what we want the streetscape to look like, what to do about parking, maybe after the opportunity to do something is gone. So this particular building would take out of circulation quite a few parking spots, um, as did One East Pleasant, you know, without bringing anyone new. So if if we want to rethink any of that, or even some communities in their zoning have um, a linkage fee, that if you take spaces out, you contribute to a kitty that would build a garage somewhere, you know, which is something that you're removing 200, you know, where are they going to go? But so it's it's a chicken, the egg that if we really want to be have take a pause and be thinking about this, while a lot of activity is going on, how do we reconcile those two? I think there's still a lot of land in the downtown area that can be developed. Um, there is a parcel right next to this building that's being proposed now that I think the developers have an eye on. Um, there are also parcels that are owned by the Central Amherst Realty Trust that um, are likely to be developed in the future. And there's bound to be a lot of redevelopment, um, both in the downtown and in the adjacent BL. So I think that, um, the, you know, the opportunity to use um, uh, amended zoning to get what we want is still there. The fact that this building came along is, you know, kind of unfortunate in the in the fact that we're currently working on our zoning. But um, you know, we can't really control what right. developers propose, and I think they've had this in the works for a long time. So, um, you know, we'll do the best we can to get things right. done as quickly as we can, but. Uh, I don't think we can fight this particular um, project. Man Mandy's ha hand went up as well. Yeah, um, I, I also wanted to respond to that um, with something Rob Moore, our building inspector, uh, responded to or answered a question of one of the CRC members yesterday with regard to that. Um, and hopefully I will get the information right. Um, but one of the CRC members asked what bylaws apply if a project is sort of filed and not approved yet um, as it relates to some of the zoning we're looking at. And his response was, I believe that the zoning that applies is basically um, if the permit, if the special permit has been issued, um, the zoning that is in effect when it was issued generally applies. But once a hearing is notified in the public, you know, once the hearing is put in the paper as being held for a zoning bylaw change. He was implying that that new bylaw would apply 
um, to any projects that hadn't yet been permitted when the hearing notice went in the paper. And so given an answer like that, I can say as chair of CRC, I'm taking that and the members are taking that response into consideration as we look at um, uh, the planning and agenda setting for dealing with the bylaws that were presented to CRC yesterday and, and which ones to, to concentrate on sort of first. Okay. Thank you. So any other questions? You're, you're hearing from two people that are in the middle of, well, three people that are in the middle of all of this, right? <laughs> and, and then, so I think, I think, thank you very much. I think that- So we, got, we have one actual, sorry, we have one more project, which is the sustainability improvement project. Um, so Dave, Stephanie and I worked on that. And so the request is for 50,000 this year, and then there's a placeholder for 50,000 in future years. That's definitely an area, you know, I could see that amount increasing in future years as we have more actionable steps to take around sustainability. Um, it isn't designated yet as to what specific projects it will go towards, but, you know, there are some things we have in mind. Um, you know, we've heard about, you know, upfitting some of the vehicles to potentially be hybrid version or putting in the anti-idling technology. Um, there's the resident capital request, which again, we have a grant that we're hoping to get for that. But if that grant doesn't come through, um, it could potentially support a project like that. Um, the charging stations we've been talking about. And so there's, there's no shortage of potential ways that we can use that money wisely um, in the future. And, and Dave, I'll turn it over to you if you have any other additional thoughts on that. Oh, thanks, John. You 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 pretty much covered it. The only one I would add is that um, in my experience working with Stephanie over the last many years, and and particularly with the Green Communities um, grant funding, is that often to be eligible for Green Communities or other sustainability grants, um, it's incumbent upon the city or town to have already done some work, and and. Um, I don't mean to use the word consultants, but often these are engineering studies, these are architectural studies, these are energy studies that need to be done in order to qualify to upgrade the system in building A, B, or C, you need to have done a considerable amount of work on, on uh, analysis and assessment of the HVAC system, uh, the, the, the airflow, all of these things. And this is true in our schools, in our, in our town buildings, and the list goes on. So this money could potentially be used, some of this money could potentially be used for that. And sometimes that can leverage, we can invest a couple of thousand dollars in having the, an analysis done. And that could, that could leverage you know, $150,000 from green communities or other sources. So I know I've, I've uh, spent many hours with Stephanie where we're so close and we want to apply for a grant, but we don't have that pre-work done. And it's not something really that town staff can do. We have very talented staff in, in, in our building commissioner, Rob Mora, and our uh, facilities uh, uh, manager, um, Jeremiah um, LaPlante. Um, Jeremiah, I'm having a brain freeze. LaPlante. La LaPlante, I'm sorry. Uh, been a long day. LaPlante. Um, and they're both very talented, but sometimes you need to bring in some real energy uh, uh, experts to, to do these studies. So thanks. Questions? Mandy. Um, you mentioned the resident capital request, and I know it's not currently on the CIP anywhere, but it seems to be um, being leaned on as a project that might be funded. And I know the regional school committee and their capital plan had um, sort of essentially that project there, but it had some indication that it would be co-funded by Amherst separately, even though we pay for a portion of the Regional School Committee Capital Plan. So I guess what they came forward with was just regional school plots of land. And so if it gets funded in a, from Amherst's capital funding or this Green Communities Sustainability Fund, in addition to the regional funding, are we going to add Amherst owned land instead of just regional land to those, um, I guess the study on feasibility on solar canopies? So um, I don't think we know the answer yet. I know, for example, the grant 
program that we're looking at for that, that's similar to the resident capital request. Um, the grant would be for expertise and, and um, the people, it wouldn't be for money. Um, this is the way I understand it is that the, we, they would provide the people who can do the work. Um, so at that point we would look to them to say, can you do the region as well? Or can you do the town? And then what other potential areas would we want them to look at if they can? Um, so we just don't, I don't think we know the answer to that yet, but it's something we'll definitely look into how we can partner um, for these projects that are similar. I just, I, and, and Sean, if you can clarify with Andra and the two students, I heard them say not just the high school and middle school, they wanted to do broader public land. So if there is some way of marrying, if, if the region put in $15,000 for something solar and if we did the grade schools, you know, or, or others, but just thinking of what, what Dave just said to get ready that if we can do some assessments on where things can go and charging stations more generally, um, it would be useful if, big grant money comes along. So I heard them, I mean, I know they're high school students, so they're originally looking at the high school parking lot, but I, I think they wanted to think more broadly than that. Yeah. Too. And, and our grant, again, the grant that um, Stephanie is, is working on is a broader, isn't focused on the region. It's a broader community-wide um, focus. Um, so, so exactly what you said. And, and I just have a question. When Mandy said it's not on your list, um, you know, when we look at the spreadsheet, it doesn't have a little line. This fifty thousand could potentially be a placeholder that would do the twenty-five they asked for. So when we have a discussion next week on our reactions to what we've heard, um, is that a potential? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's again, we we left it intentionally broad because, to Dave's point, a lot of times these things are sort of opportunities that arise where you can make a big impact. And so we didn't want to say it's definitely going to be used for this or that. Um, we, we sort of intentionally left it flexible in that way. Okay. I'm looking around, we, there is, um, I'm, I'm looking around the room for any other comments. Um, if there aren't anyone, I want to open it up for public comments. We have one attendee, at least last time I looked, we have one. Um, and to see, is there anyone on the committee who has, uh, Tammy? Um, on the schools, um, Doug Slaughter had um, copier replacements and we did not discuss that. It is something that's coming annually, but that was omitted from the schools list. I think we discussed that last time, didn't we? When yeah, we, did we discussed that with um, IT. Um, very briefly, but he discussed that during the night. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I thought that was either a duplicate or, yeah. Okay. Any other questions on this? Let me just check. So I am opening it up for public comments to the extent we have any. And um, Sean, you're the host. So our public, there is a person with a hand up. So Tony Cunningham. Hi, bring. yeah, Tony Cunningham. Thanks so much. I just wanted to make a comment and a bit of a pitch for Crocker Farm repairs. Um, I was on the feasibility study group that evaluated the building and um, looked at what would be needed in the case of a school consolidation plan. And I know you have the larger project on the pending list page in the in the capital improvement plan document. I would just suggest that you reduce the higher number on the range to the 19,750 um, because the larger number was for an enrollment of 555 students, which won't apply now in the scenario we're looking at with the MSBA project. And then as far as what you have in the capital improvement plan line items for Crocker Farm, in the five years, they add up to about four and a half million. Uh, the base repair estimates by TSKP were about 9 million. So there's a few things missing. Um, TSKP were proposing a complete HVAC replacement using a VRF system. And they had security upgrades also, um, Sally port entry and glazing and a few other things that aren't currently on your plan. So I just wondered if you could um, just make a, a plug for cross-referencing what's in your plan with what was 
recommended by TSKP and then updating the total on the pending list uh, to have that lower number. Um, since I think that 27 million wouldn't apply. That's everything, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, Tammy, did you put your hand up again or is that still, okay, that's. So I, I saw Sean took notes. Okay, I think um, we are finished for the evening. Um, and I just wanna remind people that next week we're coming together to discuss recommendations and uh, sort of thinking about the draft report. And um, Sean is go has offered to send us out some basic framework to be thinking about. Unlike previous years, uh, we've been given a gift of the requested amounts of money almost match the amount of money we have to spend. So um, rather than, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean everything goes on the list or we feel differently. But I think that for me, at least, it means we should also look at the five-year plan, not just this year plan. So a focus on this year, but to the extent there are questions or things to discuss for next week. So Sean, I think you offered to send out some things to think about um, to the committee. To, yeah, to, to um, next week, yes. So, so I'll send out the summary page again of the five-year plan so you can see um, what it looks like. And then we, uh, um, Kathy and I have been keeping sort of the uh, key questions or, or points that people have been making during the presentations. Um, not that those are the only topics to consider, but just to kind of remind people when we come back for discussion, here are some of the things that um, were raised as questions or issues. Um, so. So we'll send that out as well. Okay, so I wanna thank everyone. And I think we can just say that um, our tonight's meeting is adjourned. May I ask- Chris, a Chris has her hand up, sorry. Yeah, there's a, yes, where? I want to know if I can get a copy of the most recent five-year plan that involves the planning department because I think I have an outdated spreadsheet. Yes, you may. Thank you. <laughs> I will send that to you tomorrow. Thanks. Okay, sorry, Chris, I didn't see your, your hand, but then I think we are adjourned unless someone's hand miraculously goes up again and catches my eye. But if not, then thank you all for staying with us through the evening. Good night. <laughs>